Nos waith a croiso. Welcome to the National Waterfront Museum and Swansea Pride. Tonight we are pleased to welcome you to a debate that is national in its theme and specific to the city of Swansea. And I'm delighted to say here to argue both for and against this motion we have Amy Dillwyn herself, here before us in two different phases of her life. With the first Amy, please take to the floor. Thank you. They did not know who I was when I was born. No, of course they knew who I was. I was the third child and the second daughter of Lewis Llewellyn Dillwyn and Bessie de la Beach. What I mean to say is that I was without a name for a few weeks before they settled upon Elizabeth Amy Dillwyn. But at any rate, I was the Dillwyn chick, the youngest in the family and happy to play that role. I enjoyed my place as the youngest, enjoyed being indulged perhaps, and knew what was what. But then Essie came along, my younger sister. I was seven years old and I was furious. How dare she usurp me? What was I to do now? I was neither youngest nor oldest, and I wasn't a boy. Where did that leave me? What or who was I to be? I rather wanted to be Harry, my brother, or at least be like him. When father became member of parliament for Swansea, we left Parkwern in Sketty for Hendra Voylan, a large house built by my father with grounds that were perfect for a tomboy. With Harry, I climbed trees, chased butterflies and got covered in mud. And it was with Harry that I tried my first cigar. An unconventional family, perhaps, some would say. We were raised to have inquiring spirits. We asked questions, explored and knew our own minds. At least I did. Rather too well, some would say. I got through several governesses who said that I was headstrong and willful. But perhaps being headstrong is a useful weapon when one is otherwise unsure of one's role. I knew what I was supposed to be. I was to abandon any notion of becoming a man like Harry and do as many my older sister had done. I was to be a wife and a mother. That was to be my role. I did try. I took my place in society as a young lady should, and I enjoyed the social whirl of London balls and dinners, the drawing room gossip and flirting, fine gowns and jewels, and the attention the scrutiny, always on one's guard, upholding and maintaining the good Dillwyn name, always on display. I was 18 when Llewellyn Thomas proposed to me. A good family and a good match. I accepted because it was the thing to do that was to be my role now. But I would no longer be Amy Dillwyn. I would have to become somebody else. Llewellyn died four months into the engagement. Smallpox. Four months which had passed like a strange dream of troubles and melancholy. Poor Llewellyn. I burned his letters in the end. What an injustice I had done him. A man with whom I was not really in love. I didn't understand marriage. In fact, I rather thought I would join a sisterhood and devote my life to God. 
Henry Hussey Vivian said that a woman who does not marry goes contrary to all the laws of the world. But why must women marry? And why marry a man? Why should I not marry Olive, for example? Be a wife to her and she to me. My love for her has led me always to be better and never to be worse. She is the person who has influenced my character more strongly than anyone else. Oh well, <laughs> if I am to be a lone woman, so be it. When Essie married, I was troubled again. Why was I not to have the happiness of loving and being loved? It made me quite ill. I took to my couch, stuck like a limpet on a rock. What was the use? How was I to occupy myself? Yes, there was charitable work with the people of Calais. Yes, I became mistress of Hendrevoilen after my mother's death. But what else was there? What of intellectual pursuits? It seemed the game was not worth the candle. In time, I began to write and to recover, using my brains because I can't use my muscles, which last I should greatly prefer. Articles and reviews in The Spectator, children's stories, and my novels. The Rebecca Rioter, A Burglary, Jill, and others. I tried so very hard to defend the Dilwyn name when Essie ran away. She eloped, leaving her husband and five children. There was no telling her. She would insist on doing as she pleased. Oh, to be able to do as one pleases. To absolve oneself of responsibility and carve out one's own path abandoning one's obligations to society and family duty. Essie's husband drank himself to death. He was much like my brother. Harry was only 47 when he died. I thought the Swansea press very unkind, writing of his Rabelaisian thirst. What of the Harry I knew? What of the easy way that Harry had with everyone? And what of me? Harry and I were supposed to grow old together at Hendrevoilen. Father had only a life interest in the property. What was to become of me? What role should I play now? Thank you. And now let's move to the issue in hand, whether a statue might be raised to this remarkable woman in the city. This house believes that the city and county of Swansea should erect a statue in the city to honour the life and work of Amy Dillwyn. To answer the question, as to whether there should be a statue to honour my life and work, I say, why not? There can be no objection on grounds of one's place in society. The Dillwins have good social standing. My father and grandfathers were gentlemen, men of parliament, science and business. Yes, business. Statues are no longer the preserve of the aristocracy, after all. We Dillwins hold our own in society both here in Swansea and in London. I have been presented at court, attended royal drawing rooms, and dined with the statesmen of this country and elsewhere. And it's good enough for the Vivians, it would seem. John Henry Vivian and his son, Henry Hussey Vivian, 
Both have their imposing figures standing on plinths here in Swansea. And if their names are to be remembered by Swansea by way of statues, then the Dilwyn name should be too. It's important, I think, that the Dilwyn name be afforded respect and our good reputation remembered. Oh, <laughs> do not be mistaken in thinking that I believe one station in life alone merits a statue. Of course not. As I said, I have often found myself in the company of royalty and statesmen, but have been more impressed by men who have made their mark purely on intellectual merit and courage. And if this statue is to honour me, and not just the Dilwyn name, then I should like to earn my claim to a statue through hard work and not depend on any social status. Take, for example, William Thomas of Lan, the former mayor of Swansea, whose statue stands in Victoria Park, not to remember him as a mayor, but as a champion of green spaces for ordinary people. I too should like to be remembered for being of some use to society and for good works. I used to wonder if I should ever be in any way of use in the world. I suppose one wouldn't have been put into the world unless one was meant to fill some hole in it. I should like to be remembered for intellectual endeavour too. I would put up with being a genius of any kind, but it would please me to be recognised for my writing and to inspire others to take up a pen. An influence I would cast long after I am gone. A legacy. Yes, I should like to be worth something to others after I am dead. A statue would be a permanent reminder of what is possible. What is left then? An objection on the grounds that I am not a man? Would people find a statue of a woman shocking? But it's true, isn't it? They are all men. From the Vivians to William Thomas. There is not a statue of a woman to be seen at all in Swansea, is there? Think about it. Indeed, I would wager that you cannot bring to mind a statue of a woman in all of Wales. Certainly not a woman unadorned by crown or orb and scepter. Can you? A real woman who lived and breathed, not a work of fiction or the product of a sculptor's imagination, and a man's imagination at that, no doubt. There are exciting schemes afoot to correct this, of course. It will not be long before a statue of Betty Campbell, Wales's first black head teacher, will take its place in Cardiff. One hopes it will not be long before my contemporary, Cranogwen, writer, sailor, lover of Jane Thomas, is similarly remembered at Llangranog. Why should there not be room for me and others like me? I should like to take my place among these men of status and industry. I wonder if I would blend in or stand out. I would not wish to stand out as a curiosity. I would want to stand alongside them as their equal. Perhaps they could dress me in mannish clothes. Do you suppose I could be portrayed with my cigar? I am not being entirely facetious. I feel sometimes that I am half a man. I am quite in earnest about it. But on the other hand, I would not want to disappear amongst these men and become lost. 
just another statue. It must be there for the right reasons. Something talked about, yes, but set apart from these statues of my Swansea contemporaries because it will suggest the casting off of old ways and the pursuit of the new. The Dilwyn pioneering spirit has long been known in Swansea. Let us make that spirit a permanent source of inspiration with a statue. Here stands Amy Dilwyn, set in stone. Thank you, and now we'll move over to Amy from a later time. You have heard opening comments from my younger self, but let me add a few words now that I find myself hurtling towards my dotage. In 1892, my father, Lewis Llewellyn Dilwyn, died. He had been MP for 37 years and a Swansea institution. I had not been forgotten by my father in death. He had the foresight and generosity to name me successor to his business, the Llan Samlet Smelting Works. Yes, a noisy, dirty, smelly smelter works, which is also a full 100,000 pounds in debt. Further upheaval followed. As soon as after losing both siblings and parents, my beloved Olive was to pass away in London. I was also to lose my home. For the law says a woman cannot inherit an estate. It was my cousin John who was to occupy the only home I had known, leaving me with little more than a bankrupt business. I determined to pull my fortunes around. 200 workers depended on me to keep the business alive and to return it to profitability. A donkey cart and my own strong legs would ferry me from West Cross to the works at Clan Samlet. Those who found themselves unable to take direction from a woman or didn't believe that I could achieve the impossible quickly left the business and ensured that I was surrounded by those who trusted me. I became known for a practical new uniform, one that enabled me to visit the factory without changing my clothes three times a day. And why not? I studied metallurgy, chemistry, and the processes of alloy smelting. I travelled to the zinc mines of Algeria and put my excellent knowledge of languages to the test and negotiations. I sharpened my business skills and got the account books in order assisted ably by my most reliable manager, Mr. Caulfield. Finally, we had the business out of chancery and the creditors paid off. By 1900, Dilwyn and company were once again turning a profit. Since then, the business has been sold to a German buyer, in the long run, the best option for its long-term survival. And what of me? Well, now I am an insignificant shareholder, but not one entirely without influence. I sit on the education and health boards. I have championed new schools, supported museums and galleries. I raise my voice wherever I can in support of women getting the vote, and with it, decent pay and conditions. Love of variety and a thirst for adventure has been the principal cause of my actions throughout the years, along with an unshakable devotion to my duty to others. In latter years, the press have rather taken me up, and I appear to still be an object of some interest. Hence, our gathering here tonight. Thank you. And now for your interpretation of the statue debate. This house believes that the city and county of Swansea should erect a statue in the city centre to honour the life and work of Amy Dilwyn. In order to answer the question that has been put here tonight, I would like above all to consider three questions. What is a statue? What does it do? What is it for? 
Well, the dictionary definition is disarmingly simple. The statue is a carved or cast figure of a person or animal, especially one that is life-size or larger. But further questions persist. What is it for? Well, it's there to memorialise or honour a figure of note. But then the question becomes more vexed. Who decides on such figures? Man or woman? Rich or poor? Well-known or anonymous? Powerful or weak? I think we are all agreed that this club is not open to everyone. Decisions on these things are generally left to the rich and the powerful, although I do acknowledge the exception in this case. Which leads me to the following point. Who is a statue for? For the great and the glorious, or rather for the greater glory of the great and the glorious. It strikes me that statues are raised most often by those with a story to tell and a particular account to relate of their idols. History, they say, is told by the victor, and their account of it is seen in our civic monuments. The erecting of a statue seems to me to be a grandiose, self-congratulatory act that knows neither humility nor error. And then there is the problem of its composition. A statue is granite, unchanging it, cannot adapt with time. Unlike molten ore that is constantly undergoing transmutation, the story it tells cannot be revised. And once in place, can it ever be altered or removed? without war or revolution? I think not. You've heard my younger self say that statues across time are overwhelmingly of men. In our city alone, I can cite Vivian upon Vivian and that vulgar wordsmith Dylan Thomas. There are statues of men who've never lived. Dylan Thomas again and his Captain Cat. There's even a statue of a dog, Jack. My own dear crack would be in excellent company, no doubt. But no women. Why, then I hear you say, surely time to redress the balance? Why not be the first and lead the way? Because I would suggest we choose to play no part in this protracted beauty contest. We don't need our likeness put up to be gawked at. And sensible though I am of the honour, how in the end would you represent me, whom I hardly know myself? Would you show a teacher, a benefactor, campaigner, explorer, author, industrialist, grand dame? I rather expect you'd favour a cartoon image of a woman in a Homburg hat smoking a cigar. I resist such attempts to define me. If we're to have a statue, then we had better have at least six. Well, then I come to the cost. Nothing seems to me to be a more of a profligate waste of public funds. I hear in this exercise in ingratiation that a statue of Lady Rhonda is proposed that it will cost 100,000 pounds. Cronogwen, Elaine Morgan, Elizabeth Andrews, £75,000. In Ireland, I've been told that a statue of a goat man is planned in the town of Ennis Diamond that will cost £50,000. Where will this exercise and indulgence end? Think instead how much good could be done with these sums. Surely we can pay our respects to servants of the people in better ways. I would rather see an academic fund or a bursary for the better education of young women. The Amy Dillwyn Fund for the Improving Mind, perhaps. I would be delighted to be remembered through any number of charitable institutions. The state of housing is no better now in parts of the city than it was when I first worked in the slums of Killay. Unbelievably, soup kitchens are still in operation. There is so much need and so much to be done. Let us put this money to seeing that the people of our city are properly housed and fed. I have only ever wished to be of some use. Statues are cold and lifeless. Not until I have worn through the leather of my boots 
will I be happy to sit upon a plinth of stone, an object for the gaze of passers-by. I myself have never felt attachment to others in the way that some do, save to Olive, my wife. She has been the good influence on my life, the force behind my better self. I have no need of the veneration of others, but would rather imagine myself a handsome knight revering a distant princess, as in the old books of chivalry. And that foolish notion being impossible, let me live on instead in the charitable works that I have supported and in the spirited women of my novels. Thank you. Thank you for such an interesting debate. Hopefully it's given the people at home something to think about. Now let's move on to the Q&A with Professor Kirsty Bahata.